On the 11th of January 1965, a group of four children would be out to Cronulla Beach for the day, accompanied by their older sister and her best friend and next door neighbour. After a morning of play at Cronulla, they would all then go for a walk to the sand hills at nearby Wanda Beach. The younger children complaining of the sand burning their legs due to the afternoon becoming blustery. So the two older girls would sit them down in a more sheltered spot where they would hand them a transistor radio for company and the girls would continue up into the dunes on their own. Later that afternoon, the four younger children would return home and report their older sibling and her friend as missing. I'm Andrea M and this is Real Crime Down Under. But before we delve into another unsolved and baffling real crime down under, if you love crime, disasters, myths and legends, and a little of the paranormal thrown in, and that's what you're interested in, you just found the channel for you because that is mainly what I do here. So if you could in turn do me the huge favor of repeatedly jumping on the like button, overworking the subscribe button and drop a comment on two on today's case in the comment section and share this around with your friends it would help me out a ton and allows me to keep creating content for you guys just like this and i'd love to give a shout out to my lovely subscriber shay who i met the other day we're actually having her nails done and she sat right next to me and introduced herself so shout out for shay it was lovely to meet you and that being said let's begin 1960s Australia. The surf music movement is in full swing, it's the summer holidays and people in their thousands are flocking to local beaches. And it would be the same for Christine Sharrock and her best friend and next door neighbour Mary Ann Schmidt and her younger siblings. Cronulla Beach is a patrol beach on Bait Bay in Cronulla, New South Wales, Australia. The Cronulla Pavilion and the Cronulla Life Saving Club are two prominent buildings located close to the sand. Cronulla Park sits behind the beach. The Cronulla Rock Pools are between Cronulla Beach and North Cronulla Beach. Mary Ann Schmidt had arrived in Melbourne, Victoria with her family from West Germany in September of 1958. At the time, the Schmidt family consisted of parents Helmut and Elizabeth and her siblings, Helmut Jr. Hans, Peter, Trixie and Wolfgang. Another child, Norbert, was born the following year. After arriving in Australia, the Schmidt family lived in a migrant hostel in Unandera, New South Wales, before settling in Tamora. In 1963, Helmut Schmidt moved the family to Sydney after unfortunately being diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. The family found a home in West Ryde. In June the next year, Mr. Schmidt would succumb to his illness and sadly pass away. Marianne Schmidt's next door neighbour was another 15 year old girl called Christine Sharrock, who lived with her grandparents, Jim and Jeanette Taig. Sharrock had also lost her father in 1953 and her mother Beryl remarried and was living in the North Sydney suburb of Seven Hills. Sharrock moved in with her grandparents by choice and when the Schmidts moved next door she developed a very strong friendship with Mary Ann and as we just explored that girls were the same age. On the 1st of January 1965 at the height of the surf music era Sharrock and Schmidt visited the beach at Cronulla a lot which had been a popular picnic spot as well for the entire Schmidt family. Diary entries read the day after the murders indicated that the girls had kissed some boys at the beach that day. The following day, the Schmidt children visited Cronulla Beach again, but this time without Christine. Meanwhile, Mrs. Schmidt had been admitted to hospital for a major operation, leaving Helmut Jr. and Mary Ann, the two eldest siblings, in charge of the household. On Saturday, the 9th of January, Christine and Mary Ann would ask Mrs. Smith, who was still hospitalised, if it would be okay for them to take the younger children to Cronulla the next day, and they were given permission. However, rain had prevented this trip. On Monday, the 11th of January, 
accompanied by Schmidt's four younger siblings, the girls again set off by train for Cronulla Railway Station after transferring at Redfern. They arrived at the beach at about 11 a.m., but it was very windy and the beach was closed. The group then decided to walk down to the southern end of the beach and sheltered amongst the rocks. Eight-year-old Wolfgang still wanted to go for a swim, so Schmidt went with him to a shallow part of the surf away from the rocks. After they returned to the group, they had a picnic. At some point during this time, Sharik left the others and went off by herself. When Sharik returned to the group, they decided to go for a walk into the sand hills behind Wanda Beach. Around 1 p.m., the group had reached a point around 400 metres beyond the Wanda Surf Club and they stopped to take shelter behind a sand hill as the younger children were still complaining about the conditions. The wind was still whipping sand against their legs and the conditions had become extremely unpleasant for the younger kids to say the least. So Schmidt told her younger siblings that she and Sharik would return to the rocky area at the south end of the beach where they had hidden their bags. Then they would return to fetch the other children and head home. Instead, however, the girls continued up into the sand hills. And when Peter Schmidt noticed them going the wrong way, and he told them, hey, you're going the wrong way, they laughed at him and they walked on. The Schmidt children remained waiting behind the sand hill until 5 p.m., at which time they returned to collect their bags, including Schmidt and Sharik's purses, and they went home on the last train. Arriving back to their home at about 8 p.m. that night, Schmidt and Sharik were reported as missing by 8.30 p.m. that night by Sharik's grandmother. And of course, we need to remember Mrs. Schmidt is still in hospital recovering from the major operation she had had at this time. The next morning, on Tuesday, the 12th of January, a man named Peter Smith was taking his two young nephews for a walk through the Wanda Beach Sandhills. Some distance north of the Wanda Surf Club, he discovered what he thought to be a store mannequin buried face down in the sand. He brushed the sand away from the head and it was then he realised that it was a body. And the police were called from the surf club. At this point, Smith believed he had found only one young woman buried in the sand. After investigators arrived on the scene and the scene was examined, Schmidt was found laying on her right side with her left leg bent. Sharik was face down with her head against the sole of Schmidt's left foot. Both had scratch marks on their faces and there was a 34 metre, 37 yard long drag mark leading to the scene. Police determined that Sharik had possibly fled while Schmidt may have been dying to raise the alarm and to get help only to have been caught incapacitated and dragged back to the body of her friend. After an intensive search was undertaken to find the murder weapons, a long knife and some sort of blunt instrument, but they were never found and tons of sand from around the murder scene were sifted through and various items were found, including a blood stained knife blade, but police were unable to link it to the murders. The autopsy for Sharik found she had a blood alcohol level of 0.015, which may have meant that Christine may have consumed a glass of beer. But alcohol was not found in Schmidt's autopsy. It was also discovered that Sharik had consumed food, cabbage and celery, possibly a Chico roll that was different from the rest of the party. It is suspected this occurred while she was alone. Christine had not taken food from home with her as the Schmitz had, but had a bottle of cold drink and a one pound note to buy herself some lunch. Sharik's skull had been fractured by a blow to the back of the head and she had been stabbed 14 times. Schmitz's throat had been deeply slashed and she had been stabbed six times. Their underwear had also been cut, or their bathing suits, and attempts had been made to sexually assault both girls. Semen was found on both the girls, but the autopsy showed that their hymens were intact. Schmidt's brother Hans had viewed photos of her body and to him, he had thought that she had been stabbed 
a lot more than the police had said, at least 25 to 30 times, and she'd also been decapitated because of how viciously her throat had been cut. It was also during Sharak's absence that Wolfgang noticed a teenage boy hunting crabs. Later, he claimed to have seen the boy twice more, once in the company of his sister and Sharak, and then another time walking alone, and this was much later. And it was also said that the boy appeared to be hassling the girls and they were trying to walk quickly away from him. There has been doubt, however, about the description of this person, as Wolfgang's testimony over time variously suggested that the boy had been carrying a homemade spear gun and a fishing knife, or possibly one or both. The last official sighting of Schmidt and Sharrock was around 12.45 by local fireman Dennis Dostine, who was walking in the area with his son and saw the girls walking about 730 metres, approximately 800 yards north of the Surf Club. Dostine told police that they seemed to be hurrying and one of the girls was often looking behind her as if they were being followed. However, he did not see anybody else in the company of the girls and there had been a number of people in the area who were never identified and would never come forward. The funerals were held on the 20th of January and a £10,000 reward was posted in February, later converted to Australian $20,000 in 1966, which stood unchanged as of August 2002. In April 1966, the coroner handed down his report, by which time police had interviewed some 7,000 people, making it the largest investigation in Australian history. Despite this, the murders quickly became a cold case and none of the three main suspects fit the description of the young surfer youth who has never been identified. The case was reopened in 2000 and in February 2012, the New South Wales Police Forces Cold Case Unit announced that a weak male DNA sample had been extracted from a pair of white shorts worn by Christine Sharrock. While admitting that current technology was unable to provide more information, police were confident that future advances would give more assistance. In July 2014, police said that a semen sample taken from Schmidt's body had been lost and could not be located despite an extensive search. Cess Johnson, a former detective who had investigated the murders, was given a painting in 1975 by Alan Bassett. Bassett had been jailed for murdering Caroline Orphan, a 19-year-old woman, on the night of Saturday the 11th of June 1966 who was attacked, sexually assaulted, strangled, and then had her skull crushed with a rock. On the night of her murder, Caroline Orphan went out for a night out with her friends to the Iron Workers Club on Crown Street in Wollongong where she met Bassett. Sent to prison for life, Bassett served 29 years before being released in 1995. The painting titled a bloody awful thing showed an abstract landscape. Johnson believed the painting showed blood trails, a broken knife blade and the body of a victim and became convinced that Bassett was the one to kill her. He also became convinced that it showed a scene from the murders that only the killer would know, as well as clues to the also unsolved murders of two more women, Wilhelmina Kruger and Anna Dowlingcoa. Despite the scepticism of other detectives, Johnson wrote a book about the case. Before it could be published, however, he was sadly killed in a pedestrian accident. Other detectives, while retaining professional respect for Johnson, concluded that he was wrong in his belief. One person Johnson convinced, however, was Daily Mirror crime reporter Bill Jenkins. Jenkins repeated Johnson's claims in his ghost-written memoirs as crime goes by, devoting an entire chapter to the Wanda Beach murders. Most of the chapter was essentially a repeat of what he had written in his earlier book, Crime Reporter, but he mentioned Johnson, Bassett and the painting as well. Bassett commenced proceedings for defamation in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, which he was entitled to do after the Attainder rule was abolished by the Felons Act 1981 in New South Wales. Although given his history of mental illness, the proceedings were commenced by the Protective Commissioner as his tutor. 
After a ruling on the form and capacity of the imputations, Bassett versus Ironbark Press in 1994, the publisher pleaded defences of justification, Bassett being a convicted murderer, and the proceedings never went any further. Since his release, Bassett has voluntarily given a DNA sample to clear his name, but whether or not he has been eliminated as a suspect by DNA is yet to be publicised. A second suspect is Christopher Wilder, and I will be doing an entire video about Christopher Wilder in a future Real Crime Down Under. Two years prior to the Wanda Beach murders, he had been convicted of a gang rape on the Sydney beach, which led police to include him as a suspect. Wilder emigrated to the United States in 1969, where he would embark on a series of serial killings in the early 1980s. While visiting his parents in Australia in 1982, Wilder was charged with sexual offences against two 15-year-old girls whom he had forced to pose nude. He fled back to the US and in the first half of 1984, he committed eight murders and attempted several more. Wilder was accidentally killed during a struggle with police in New Hampshire on the 13th of April, 1984. A third suspect, not well publicized until around 1998, and we did delve into this suspect a little bit on our last Missing Down Under where I covered the disappearance of the three Beaumont children in 1966. And if you haven't watched it yet, I will leave a link in the description box below because it is tied loosely to this case. So a third suspect and not well publicized until 1998 is Derek Percy, who had been imprisoned since 1969 for the murder of a child on a beach in Victoria. Percy was considered too dangerous to be released and is the prime suspect for a number of murders of other children in Melbourne and Sydney, but he died in 2013 from cancer. He was considered a leading suspect for the Wanda Beach murders by police. While Percy can be linked to the location on the date of the murders, there were no other links found. It was hoped he would make confessions on his deathbed, but these never came. So Derek Percy would become infamous for becoming Australia's worst serial child murderer. And I think I did mention it in my last video, we will be exploring in depth into Derek Percy on this real crime down under as well. So he will be another famous murderer from Australia that we will be exploring soon in greater depth. Other possible linked cases included two far less well-known murders that also occurred in early 1966 in the days following the nationally publicised disappearance of the Beaumont children, which police at the time speculated might have been connected to the Wanda Beach killer. And this brings us to the two murder victims mentioned previously, Kruger and Dowling Coa. On Saturday, the 29th of January, 1966, a 56-year-old cleaning lady named Wilhelmina Kruger was killed in Piccadilly Centre on Crown Street in Wollongong. Her bloody body was found around 5.45am at the foot of the basement level stairs by a butcher who had arrived to start his morning's work. After having first been assaulted three floors above, probably at around 4.30am, she had been brutally dragged down the escalators and the stairs. She was then strangled, stabbed, mutilated and was found naked from the chest down. Police also found cigarette burns in her clothing and blonde hair was found at the scene. In the time prior to the Kruger murder, she had become nervous that somebody was watching her and stalking her and she had been getting her husband to drive her to work because she didn't feel safe to walk the short distance to work on her own. Similarly, the lights in the car park within the centre had shown recent signs of tampering and they had been tampered with again on the morning of the murder. A major clue came during the investigation when a witness who lived near the centre was waiting at the gate of his property for the morning newspaper to be delivered and he had reported seeing a vehicle speeding by at around 4.45am on the day that Wilhelmina Kruger was murdered. 
The witness described the vehicle as a rusty, cream-coloured utility, possibly a Holden or a Chevrolet type model, with a plywood canopy attached to the rear of the vehicle. The witness managed to give a description of the driver as a tall, lean male of dishevelled appearance. The report was corroborated by two couples visiting from Victoria who were staying at the Piccadilly Centre's motel and who had asked a mail about local accommodation shortly before the murder of Wilhelmina Kruger. The group also stated that they heard the sound of a vehicle speeding away from the Piccadilly Centre shortly after the time of the murder. The group's description of the male they spoke to matched the witness description of the male he saw speeding near the Piccadilly Centre shortly after Kruger's murder. The couple also stated that he was driving a vehicle that also matched the witness's description of the vehicle that he saw. Considered one of the most brutal attacks in the history of the state, the case also remains unsolved. Police believe that the murder might have been the work of the Wanda Beach killer but would not say why they thought this. Around midnight on Wednesday the 16th of February 1966, a 27-year-old shop assistant and lady of the night from Bondi named Anna Toskayoa Dalinkoa went missing after leaving the taxi club in King's Cross. Ten days later at around 5.30pm on the 26th of February, her semi-naked, strangled, stabbed and mutilated body was found by a truck driver who had stopped at the side of Old Illawarra Road in Manai to change a tyre. Most of Dowling Coa's clothes and belongings were missing and drag evidence showed that her body had been moved to a more visible location around three to four days prior to the discovery. Police immediately linked her brutal Jack the Ripper-like murder with that of Kruger. Investigators from that crime were called to assist. They believed that the murder might have been the work of the Wanda Beach killer. Primarily based on circumstantial evidence and similarities in modus operandi. In both the murders of Kruger and Dowling Coa, police believed that the killer was taunting them. In the Kruger murder, a witness calling himself Gary gave a statement that he and his girlfriend were sitting in his car, parked in Railway Square, directly behind the Piccadilly Centre, when he saw the utility pulling into the square sometime between 2.30 and 3am on the morning of the murder. Gary also stated that the vehicle circled Railway Square three times before turning back onto Gladstone Avenue and parking opposite the Piccadilly Centre. Police checks revealed that no such person existed on any record and the address that Gary gave detectives was false. So that's pretty sus in itself. Was old Gary the murderer or just a very helpful witness? We'll never know. The murders were the focus of an episode of Crime Investigation Australia entitled The Wanda Beach Murders, Beaumont Children Mystery. A book, Wanda, The Untold Story of the Wanda Beach Murders by Alan J. Whitaker was published in January 2003. It was also the topic of the premiere 2016 episode of Case File, the true crime podcast, which linked cases receiving a standalone episode in January 2018. And sadly, this is about where this case rather abruptly ends. The case, though cold, still remains open and as always, if you know anything, if you happen to be around at the time and you saw something that you thought was insignificant on that day, but you have a, a suspicion it may still aid the police in finally solving this crime of absolute brutality against two lovely 15 year old girls, you may make an anonymous call to Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. The family of these two innocent 15 year olds do deserve closure. So what are your thoughts and theories on today's case? I'd love to hear what you guys think, so please feel free to drop any theories or ideas in the comments section below and start a conversation and I will reply to as many of you as I can. And as always, thank you so much for watching again, because without all of you, I wouldn't be able to do this. Your subscriptions, likes, shares and comments are super, super appreciated. And stay tuned for upcoming videos. We have a new Missing Down Under coming up and it's going to be a little bit of a special one. 
the Oz Files, the Disasters Down Under, and our first paranormal investigation for 2023 is coming up next month with my Clarence Valley Paranormal Team. So stay safe, everybody. Stay aware of your surroundings, and I will see you all again very soon. And I hope you all have a brilliant week. And um, yeah, much love from the bottom of my heart for everybody who has subscribed to my channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? I would love you to join us. And um, yeah, I think that's about it for this one. Sorry, it's short. But unfortunately, there is not a lot more known about this case. Anyway, that will be all from me today. And thank you again so much. And I'll see you all soon. Bye.